Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. This is Arnav. Today I have Stefan with me. Stefan is the co-founder and CTO of Gnosis, which is building a prediction market platform. And today we are going to talk to him more about his project and try to understand that where his project is headed in the future. So hi Stefan, how are you? Hey Arnav, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for taking the time out, Stefan, and coming on the show. So can you start by giving a brief background and like what's what's your work experience and how did you actually get into crypto? Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm a computer scientist by training. So I did my bachelor and master's degree here in Germany. And yeah, then I worked in startups here in Berlin and also I worked a bit in Silicon Valley and yeah in 2013 uh, I got to know Bitcoin and so basically I, I studied together with uh, with Martin mm -hmm. uh, who was the other co-founder of Gnosis uh, and we did several projects already together when we were back in, in university so for example uh, <laughs> We wrote, at some point, we wrote like a poker bot. Uh, we wrote a tool to uh, analyze search queries. So we did quite a lot of different things. And um, in 2013, uh, Martin uh, came across a Bitcoin white paper, mm -hmm. uh, pointed out to me. And yeah, I, I read it and I, I thought it looks really like a super promising technology. But I also saw that there is, a, yeah, if if this project should actually become successful, then it needs a much, much bigger adoption. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was concerned about at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but nevertheless, um, because we're both computer scientists and we have some entrepreneurial spirit, we started looking into what we can build for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so we had a look at what was already existing for Bitcoin. And at that time, there was not that many applications yet. There was, I think, um, one application that was uh, in the works was um, uh, Open Bazaar, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there was hardly anything, and uh, we thought it would actually be interesting to build yeah, some sort of prediction markets for Bitcoin. At that time, we didn't even know that what we were building were prediction markets. We just was mm -hmm. focused on sports-related events. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we built it and it's still existing today. And then in 2015, mm -hmm. um, we realized that with Ethereum, we can build the same, but mm -hmm. in a decentralized way. So with Bitcoin, basically we just use Bitcoin as the currency. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the entire business logic was still centralized. Mm -hmm. So you just had to send us a Bitcoin, they had to trust us. Yeah, and yeah. we were sending out payouts, um, and then with, with Ethereum, we realized we can put this entire logic, this entire business logic, down mm -hmm. the blockchain layer. Yeah, yeah. Making part of the decentralized infrastructure. Yeah, and that's why we started at the beginning of 2015 uh, as part of consensus, uh, Gnosis, and gnosis mission at that time was to yeah, create a prediction market framework that allows everyone to easily build applications on top of this framework mm -hmm. um yeah and that's how we got started okay okay and i think the bitcoin prediction market is still live it's fairly or what did, what did it score yeah it's uh, called fairlay.com we are not operating or owning it anymore at all okay. um, but it's still up running Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. got it got it and so like how were the volumes like in those days um, for fairly so they were at the beginning very very low <laughs> yeah uh, i think we what we realized is that um so with prediction markets or with any kind of marketplace you have the issue that if there's no one initially trading anything then it's hard to get anyone involved yeah yeah that was basically the way how we started. We had the engine built, but then we had markets open, but there were no open orders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we didn't have this initial liquidity. And Pele only took off after we were able to provide liquidity or we found people that were providing liquidity. So liquidity is key here. And yeah. Yeah, that's something that 
is of course independent of Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever you're using. It's just necessary to get this platform started. <laughs> so, like, why only prediction markets? Uh, why did you uh, did you like? Was this something of your research area, like in your uh, undergrad or masters, or why did you only and like you did prediction markets in Bitcoin and then Ethereum? Why only prediction markets? So yeah, it was never really my field of research in university. Uh, again, like with Bitcoin, we basically just analyzed the market and we, we knew, for example, Betfair. Yeah. And Betfair was always outperforming other websites because they had a marketplace. They had a free market to, be, to define what the odds were. Mm -hmm. And realized that this is the, yeah, that this is the best way to to uh, yeah to to do this, and we realized also that only blockchain technology allows you to create a global liquidity pool where everyone is trading in the same market, mm -hmm. uh, which allows in the end to actually have the most inclusive system and also uh, the marketplace which offers the highest efficiency. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, when we were uh, then thinking about Ethereum. At that time, there was already the Orga project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we, at that time, we still saw that there's room for competition. So there was <laughs> like, Orga was already uh, releasing their white paper and we analyzed it and we saw there are some issues with Orga, uh, which will not be easily, uh, will not be easy to resolve. And we saw that today we can build something that's competitive. <laughs> um, and that's why we started building Gnosis. Got it, got it. So, like, like, let's talk about prediction markets first. Um, so, I was watching one video um, of Martin he, in which he was talking about prediction markets, and then I read about some professors who had started like f first in 1970 or 80, researching about uh, prediction markets. And so, like, how can you like walk us through like the evolution of prediction markets as a research field and? Like why, uh, what's the benefit for society uh, with prediction markets? Yeah, so um, maybe let's see like what kind of prediction markets actually exist today. Yeah. Uh, it's not like there's no prediction market available. Mm -hmm. uh, again, like the most commonly known prediction markets are sports betting markets like yeah. Betfair. Uh, mm -hmm. They exist for a long time and they are successful. Mm -hmm. And then there are other prediction markets like future markets where you are predicting the future value of an asset. Yeah. And they, are also, they also exist already for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, prediction markets are not new. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the reason why they haven't taken off yet is also because um, they involve information which in some cases is seen as yeah, insider information. Mm -hmm. which would not be allowed to be tradable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I know there was this uh, experiment also within Google. So mm -hmm. Google used a prediction market inside their own company to uh, predict different performances within Google. And I think at some point they just shut it down because they were uncertain about regulatory uh, issues. So. Mm -hmm. It is something that still has to be has to be explored uh, yeah. in like what kind of prediction markets are allowed under which conditions and which jurisdictions. Yeah. Um, but the reason why they will finally succeed is because they are the most efficient or one of the most efficient ways to uh, aggregate information. So okay. if you're interested in a specific piece of information, then you can set up a prediction market mm -hmm. to ask for the information. And by doing this, and by providing eventually net, uh, initial liquidity, you set a financial incentive for everyone who knows better than you to participate, and by doing so, revealing uh, his information. And yeah, I think information uh, is hidden in many places, mm -hmm. inside companies, inside societies, and prediction markets will become the ultimate tool to surface this information and make it available to everyone. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's the main benefit to society that it allows everyone to participate and it makes the information available to everyone. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. So like in the Google example or like some pilots that companies were doing, so who was like providing the liquidity and like were the Google employees themselves like uh, betting on laws or like how, how was that done? 
To be honest, I don't know the exact details of how Google was setting it up, but we are also thinking about uh, doing some prediction markets uh, and the way we would probably set this up is that, uh, again, like it still needs some research, but you yeah. could use, instead of using real money, you could use play money. Uh -huh. uh, but then um, basically uh, based on your performance in those prediction markets, uh, mm -hmm. you earn more play money tokens and uh, you could of course have some actual real, real incentives uh, mm -hmm. bound to those play money tokens. So it could okay. be like some, I don't know, Boni or so could be related to, to those Pay money tokens. Yeah, but again, like, I don't know exactly how how it was set up at Google. Okay, okay, and I think like you did something uh, like this in DappCon, uh, in which you were had a, like a competition in which you were giving away tokens to everyone, and how the final result they were awarded some real money. Yeah. Right, right. So basically, that's what we have as a product as well. It's called uh, Gnosis Apollo, which is a package uh, for our prediction market framework and. What it allows you to do, it allows you to do some sort of prediction market tournaments. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can define a play money token and then uh, everyone can sign up for this tournament and receive those play money tokens and then start predicting different prediction markets. And uh, during our conference, DevCon, we mm -hmm. set up different prediction markets for different um, uh, predictions within this conference. So for example, we had a prediction market on how many tickets will be sold. Yeah, and we had yeah. a market on outcomes of panel discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, so all kind of events which can be easily resolved within the time of the conference. And yeah, that uh, is a uh, fun experience, I think, for many. And uh, in the end, we rewarded the top, I think, the top 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, how does the whole platform, how do you envision uh, like it, the prediction mar market platform will be used specifically for Gnosis? Um, like say you are, I think, building a platform you, uh, that like others can like build their own uh, applications on top of. Um, so how, how, how are you targeting that as well? And uh, like, can you explain like the whole workflow of how the prediction market starts and like how it will end and how you are like thinking about decentralization. Sure, sure. So maybe to explain short, like how prediction market works in general. Yeah. So prediction market allows you to trade outcomes of future events mm -hmm. and those events can be anything. Yeah, so mm -hmm. anything uh, where the outcome is publicly known. Mm -hmm. So for example, who will be the, become the next president of the United States, mm -hmm. uh, will win the world cup, um, things like this. Mm -hmm. And um, now what you'd have to do is, uh, if you want to create a prediction market, you have to define a few properties. So mm -hmm. one of them, for example, what is the currency in which the market is traded in? Could mm -hmm. be, for example, in case of Ethereum, you could use Ether. Yeah. Or if you would like to have a more stable currency, you could use DAI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you have to define um, what is called the Oracle. So an oracle is a, an entity which provides information which is available outside of the blockchain mm -hmm. uh, to the blockchain. Uh, mm -hmm. So it can be information that is provided as a signed message or it's saved directly within a smart contract. Mm -hmm. um, and this oracle defines on uh, yeah, how the payouts are done in this market. Mm -hmm. So basically... Uh, those that are holding tokens which are representing the real outcome mm -hmm. they will be rewarded um, if the yeah, if the oracle defines that their outcome represents the winning outcome yeah yeah and that's that's also the tricky part about decentralization yeah because ultimately this oracle is the one who kind of uh is custodian of the funds within this prediction market mm -hmm. because um, ultimately it depends only on the oracle mm -hmm. uh, how the payouts are done within this prediction market yeah so if the oracle defines that the wrong outcome is a winning outcome then this would uh, make everyone lose their money who was actually predicting the correct outcome mm -hmm. and there are different ways this can be tackled. Uh, we at Gnosis currently, we are not actively working on Oracle solutions. Mm -hmm. And the main reason for that is that there are many other companies trying to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and what we are aiming for is just creating a standard which allows 
uh, everyone to use all those Oracle solutions together with our prediction market framework. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so the way how we envision this to be resolved ultimately is, uh, well, on the short term, you will use prediction, uh, you will use oracles, which already have some reputation outside of the blockchain. So for example, um, if you think about uh, regular financial trading, then Bloomberg is yeah. for many of those trades is actually the oracle. Yeah, they are yeah. an mm -hmm. entity that has reputation already. Mm -hmm. That's why everyone's trusting them. Mm -hmm. um, and now they could they could eventually provide the same information on blockchain mm -hmm. and everyone would trust them because they are known they have this reputation and if they would publish wrong information everyone would be able to see this because it's transparently saved on blockchain mm -hmm. and this would be a huge uh yeah huge reputation risk for bloomberg mm -hmm. and that's why it would be considered to be trustworthy um However, it's of course still centralized. So mm -hmm. eventually you would like to have something fully decentralized and then for decentralized solutions at different approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, Augur is building a decentralized oracle. Uh, most decentralized oracles are working with shedding coin concepts. Okay. Um, and so shedding coin concepts they involve that. Yeah. They assume that uh, they are basically asking uh, <coughs> number of participants independently what would be what would be the right outcome and the assumption mm -hmm. is uh, that if people are independently uh, answering the question like what is the real outcome then mm -hmm. and they are they are benefiting most if they all come to the same conclusion mm -hmm. then the natural shelling point is the truth uh, because that's what everyone can coordinate on if mm -hmm. they have to answer independently Okay. Uh, and using this kind of concept, um, and yeah, we will. I hope it will work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then uh, we have a decentralized oracle that that works. Okay. Ultimately, I think also we will see a combination of centralized and decentralized oracles. So if you think about centralized oracles, they are fast, requires mm -hmm. only central entity to report, but they are costly. Uh, uh, they're not costly. They are fast and cheap, but they have this yeah. risk of being centralized. And then you have decentralized oracles. Mm -hmm. And decentralized oracles, they are slow and expensive, yeah. but they have a higher security. Uh, and ultimately, it will be set up in a way that you use first a centralized oracle and you use a decentralized oracle more like a backstop in case wrong information is published by a centralized entity. Okay, okay, got it. So, like, what's the for Gnosis? Um, like what exactly are you targeting? You are, uh, like what's your end de deliverable sort of to speak um, that you that you see that uh, the users are going to see? Is it like oh, uh, uh, only a website in which like there are categories, or will it be like a multiple websites that will use the Gnosis smart contract or something like that? Yeah. So um, what we imagine is there's so many different use cases for prediction markets. Yeah. Mentioned. Uh, future contracts that yeah. could be markets on political events mm -hmm. it can be used as part of decision making processes yeah. uh, and all of those use cases they uh, they have different customers mm -hmm. they require different kind of front ends so what what we expect is that there will be many different applications they will be all based on the Gnosis smart contracts mm -hmm. um, but they will have different interfaces okay Got it. And Got it's also it. important, just as a side note here, it's also important that the Gnosis prediction market framework itself, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't require any GNO tokens, for example. So there's, it's more like, I would say, if you think about web development, it's more like Django or mm -hmm. Ruby on Rails. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no strings attached to it. It just makes sense to use it if you need a prediction market. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, well, you would reinvent the wheel. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, you started talking about the GNO tokens. So, like, what's the real utility um, of the token um, if it's not like used in the prediction market? And I think you have a stable coin, like stable token as well, which is used in Dutch X or other things. So, like, how do you see them fitting in the whole picture? Right, right, right. So, in in the end, if you think uh, about token models, um, in order to to make any token model actually work, mm -hmm. uh, you have to create some sort of network effect around your applications. 
otherwise uh, people could just copy your entire model uh, or your entire system and well use a different token mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or no token <laughs> eventually yeah. Yeah. Um, so building network effects is crucial. Mm -hmm. And um, so initially, actually, we in our one of our first implementations, we had the GNO token built into mm -hmm. uh, smart contracts. Um, but we decided now against this, and uh, like the current versions, they don't include this. And the reason for that is um, that on Ethereum today, it's really very difficult to create any kind of network effects. Mm -hmm at least uh, in the mid to long term. And this is just because Ethereum itself is too limited uh, in terms of transaction capacity mm -hmm. to actually have a significant amount of users to yeah. actually have a big effect, to actually uh, justify your own token. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, it's much more important that, that everyone who is interested in using prediction markets mm -hmm. uh, has an easy way to do so uh, and that's why our focus is just to, to make our framework as accessible as possible mm -hmm. for every kind of case. Um, and yeah, so then the question still remains, where is the GNO token used? Yeah, yeah. And so the, um, the model or the original model of the GNO token is that um, we have a two token model. Mm -hmm. so GNO token, and then you have a secondary token, which is called OWL token. Yeah. And so the way how those are related is that the GNO token mm -hmm. is a token that you can keep and lock down. Mm -hmm. And during the period where you lock this token down, it will generate a secondary token, this OWL token. Okay. And this OWL token can be used to pay fees on our different platforms. Okay. So in case there is a fee taken, in one of our platforms, you can, instead of paying the fee, you can just use this OWL token. So it's kind of like, if you think about it, you could describe GNO tokens as kind of uh, coupon generators. Mm -hmm. Or Okay. Or like a staking token, like in the system, like if you believe in the system. Yeah, so that's, that's basically, it's not yet really a staking token. There's no like slashing condition attached yeah. to that Yeah. right yeah. now. So it's just you, you lock the, there was already like a, an OWL generation, initial OWL generation, it's already over. But yeah. there will be another one at some point. So okay. you lock on the GNO token you receive in return for every GNO token initially 10 OWL tokens. And those OWL mm -hmm. tokens can now be used on those platforms to pay for fees. Mm -hmm. Currently, um, the first or the first platform that will be released within the next couple of weeks is the, is the uh, Dutch exchange. Uh, and the Dutch exchange allows you, um, yeah, allows you to pay a uh, up to 50% of the fee that is charged there with mm -hmm. OWL token. Okay. And there will be other applications or other frameworks where you can also use this OWL token in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so the way how we imagine uh, this to work is that ultimately prediction markets are just a great tool to create new types of assets. Mm -hmm. And we want to create uh, trading engines, which will allow the most efficient trading of those assets. Yeah. Not only prediction market assets, but also ESC20 tokens in general. And the Dutch exchange is the first step towards this. So ultimately, like the way how the prediction markets and the exchanges are connected is that really the prediction markets are a tool to create assets and exchanges mm -hmm. are the tool to trade them. Mm -hmm. And we will be able, or we, we are aiming to create exchange software which allows to scale beyond of what Ethereum currently allows you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and we hope that we create um, yeah, a very competitive trading engine which allows us to create the network effects that are required to actually justify also uh, the GNO token. And like if uh, someone doesn't want to like use OWL token, so how will they pay the fees? Is it, is, it, is it going to be only like with Ether? Uh, so it depends. Uh, basically, in the Dutch exchange, you have different trading pairs and you always uh, pay in the token that you were using for the exchange. So if okay. you buy uh, Ether with GNO tokens, then you pay the fee in GNO tokens. Okay, got it, got it. Um, so like you started talking about Dutch X. Um, so like 
the Gnosis team has like taken a step back and now you're like building some core infrastructure um, before like going uh, with the prediction market in the like a full throttle mode. So can you talk about like what's the uh, progress there? Like why are you building DutchX? Why are you working on the Gnosis safe? And like, are you working on like a scalability, uh, like working on Plasma or all these things as well? Um, and like, where do you see them fitting? Uh, for in the overall vision sure sure so yeah so the origin of the dutch exchange uh kind of goes back to our own original token uh, launch mm -hmm. so um many actually connect gnosis mostly with two things one is prediction market the other is the dutch auction yeah gnosis was the first team to uh do a token launch using a Dutch auction. Uh, the Dutch auction is, works in a way that um, you start with a very high price mm -hmm. per item that you want to sell and the price continuously drops over time mm -hmm. and the auction ends uh, when the amount of money which is uh, raised in this auction uh, equals um, the amount of goods sold times the current price. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we use this model for our own token uh, token launch. And what we were doing in this token sale was we were selling GNO tokens for Ether. Mm -hmm. And that's basically also an exchange. Yeah? We were exchanging GNO tokens for Ether. Yeah. Uh, and if the, the reason why auctions are great is because they allow you to define a fair price for the token. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why we were thinking about uh, applying the same model for a more generalized, for a generalized ERC20 token exchange. Mm -hmm. So now what the Dutch exchange allows you to do is it allows you to trade any type of ERC20 tokens mm -hmm. by creating an auction uh, where you are selling your token for the token that you would like to receive. Mm -hmm. Um, and every it's a fully decentralized exchange, meaning that uh, the listing process doesn't require any permission from us. Mm -hmm. So every project that would like to list their token, they can they have there's still some requirements. Like if you want to start a new auction of mm -hmm. a new token, then you have to provide ten thousand dollars worth of ether, mm -hmm. uh, which is to buy the token that you would like to list. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's also really the only requirement. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the, the other great advantage of this kind of exchange is that it aggregates liquidity over time. Yeah? So the way how those Dutch auctions are uh, done is that mm -hmm. they start at twice the market price of the token mm -hmm. and they uh, will cross the market price after six hours. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that the previous yeah. market yeah. price previous auction. Mm -hmm. um, so the expectation is that after six hours, auctions are over because they cross the current market price. Mm -hmm. And now six hours are quite a long time window mm -hmm. if you compare to other exchanges. Yeah. So uh, the normal user experience is that um, yeah, users just instantly buy a token. Yeah. yeah. So the question now is why does this auction still make sense if the user experience is so terrible? <laughs> mm -hmm. And the reason is that um, if you look at most tokens which are traded today, mm -hmm. especially on decentralized exchanges, they have very little liquidity. And there are like so many different tokens today on Ethereum and every day they are more created and hardly any of them is traded uh, efficiently because there's hardly anyone trading them. And that's why there's a big spread between bid and ask on those exchanges. Mm -hmm. In many cases, it's over 10% difference between bid and ask. Mm -hmm. So it is quite likely that if you are trading on, on, uh, on such a platform that has such a big spread that you are paying too much mm -hmm. for, yeah. for this token because you always have to pay also the spread to actually do this trade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for those tokens, it makes sense to aggregate liquidity over time. And that's what we do in this auction. We first collect the liquidity, like the funding liquidity of the auction mm -hmm. uh, over a period of time. And then we are selling them uh, in a slowly, you could compare like 
this kind of auction to a slowly executed market order you know, mm -hmm. because there's no way anyone who's who's selling the token on this exchange uh, for them to set a limit price for mm -hmm. the auction they just take whatever the market will pay for their tokens so that's why it's a market order but very slowly executed yeah. in a way yeah. that there's a window of six hours for buyers to aggregate the required buy volume mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and that's why it makes it makes sense. So you aggregate volume uh, and you have only a single clearing price in the end. Uh, yeah. So everyone will get the same price. There is no spread at all. Mm -hmm. And that's where we see two main advantages, especially on systems like blockchain, because mm -hmm. um, like what is how, how, how basically exchanges are done today yeah. is they're using a continuous order book or continuous auctions yeah, yeah. Um, but blockchain is like not continuous exactly blockchain is not continuous blockchain only knows block time yeah and this opens uh, the door for uh, attacks like front running where mm -hmm. there's one entity which has a uh, like information advantage mm -hmm. compared to everyone else on the market and can uh, yeah has a time window to uh, abuse this mm -hmm. so ultimately for example, every miner on Ethereum is in this position because they are the ones collecting Ethereum transactions and they are defining in which order they are executed. So yeah. if they, for example, see that there's a huge Ether buy order mm -hmm. in an Ethereum transaction, then they could just buy Ether uh, before they're executing this order because they know this order will impact the price on Ethereum uh, yeah. of this token. And then they can immediately sell after this. So mm -hmm. uh, this, is the, this is the big issue of every blockchain system today. Mm -hmm. uh, in the future, there might be ways to prevent those kind of attacks. But today, if you think about most decentralized exchanges, they all suffer from this. So no matter if it's 0x or Ether Delta or IDEX, mm -hmm. they all have, to some capacity at least, they have the issue of front running. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah. So like how, so how, like the question was like, how is it like fitting for in the overall vision? So, um, like Dutch X is like, I think you said that, uh, for like trading the prediction market tokens, you envision that people would use Dutch X. Um, and now you're working with safe as well. So can you explain that as well? Sure. Sure. So yeah, if you think about prediction markets is creating two types of assets and exchanges allow you to trade them. Yeah. And it also say it's kind of completing this picture because it allows you to store those assets. Mm -hmm. So if you think about uh, wallets today, mm -hmm. no matter what kind of blockchain, uh, all of them or almost all of them are using private keys. Mm -hmm. So yeah, private keys, private key accounts, they're simple. Um, you mostly have to fund this private key with uh, some of the native currency of this blockchain in order to do a transaction. Yeah. Uh, and every user has to back up the seed phrase mm -hmm. so you can restore access to this account. And this works. Yeah, it's, a, it's something where we are pretty sure that private keys are secure. Mm -hmm. They have been well tested. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they also, of course, require um, quite a lot of knowledge and understanding um, to understand what the implications are if you're using private key. Mm -hmm. And I think on this end, there are still many issues to be resolved. So I think for now, we have still, I think we have probably like maybe 100 million users which own cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. but most of them probably 80% have their funds on a centralized exchange and they have never actually used any, any wallet at all. <laughs> and those users that actually use uh, wallets, <laughs> they are using private key accounts, but they are also early adopters. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they know mostly how the system works. <laughs> Some of them don't. And then they run to issues like, oh, I forgot my password. Can you help me to restore my password? Yeah. But no not possible you just mm -hmm. lost access to your account you lost everything mm -hmm. um, and this is a big issue obviously so if you walk, actually want to onboard the next uh, I don't know 50 to 100 million users mm -hmm. to blockchain then we have to come up with better solutions yeah and yeah. that's why we started working uh, on the Gnosis safe and mm -hmm. 
what they also save is it's a personalized multi-sig wallet. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it is a two-factor authentication wallet where mm -hmm. every user has a key on their notebook and another key on their phone. Yeah. And they require to use both keys in order to send transactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they do this via, always via a proxy contract, which is the multi-sig contract. Mm -hmm. And um, this multi-sig contract allows you to uh, extend the functionality of this contract mm -hmm. by adding, for example, recovery options. Yeah. Yeah, so there can be other options to uh, regain access to this contract other than just doing a backup of your seed phrase, which yeah. you eventually lost. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's something that's in this way only possible if you use such a proxy system where a smart contract is always used to interact uh, with every uh, yeah, every other D app on Ethereum. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, like to like if we have to reach like the mass adoption for crypto, um, we have to like make it as easy for people to use like um, as like the current online banking systems. Um, and like in which if you say forgot your password, you can recover them. If say your funds uh, are misplaced or like say if you lost your credit card and someone spent those funds or uh, something happened bad in the ATM. So like uh, like if you want to have like um, for crypto to reach March adoption, we have to think uh, on like how how are we like competing with the current systems, um, and yeah, I think even you are working like uh, you were also like researching on like building a, a decentralized network of uh, like uh, KYC providers or something like that for uh, for uh, like recovery of funds. Can you talk about that as well? Yeah, so there are like many different ideas how this could be done. Yeah, uh, so there are ma mainly two ideas. Uh, um, two proposals. One is um, that you use something called paralysis proof. Okay. So the idea uh, that you kind of prove that you'd lost access to your uh, to your device mm -hmm. by um, by depositing a bond, mm -hmm. uh, and in case anyone can send a transaction, mm -hmm. then you're using this bond. Okay. But if within a time window, no one is able to send any transaction, mm -hmm. then you gain access. Okay. Of course, there are some like security concerns here. Yeah, yeah. One is that this time window might be too short. If I know you're going on vacations mm -hmm. somewhere where you have no access to anything mm -hmm. for the next, say, month or so, mm -hmm. and the time window is only two weeks, Mm -hmm. then I can just do this deposit and I know I will be able to take over your funds. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, this is probably like still not uh, secure enough. Mm -hmm. um, but you can combine this. This can be just like the first step. And you could say, once you, uh, once you were able to, to place this bond and no one was able to send the transaction mm -hmm. and, um, and you uh, reached a certain time threshold, Mm -hmm. uh, then, in addition, you can provide KYC information to one of many KYC providers mm -hmm. uh, in order to regain access to your account. Mm -hmm. So there have to be multiple steps involved. Um, okay. Another solution is uh, that's something that Uport came up with, I think initially, mm -hmm. um, was a recovery process where basically you can set up uh, a list of friends or a list of trusted accounts. A Shamir secret algorithm? algorithm? Yeah, not really. Yeah, Shamir secret is also always possible. <laughs> so, uh, but um, eventually yeah. you could also be using Shamir secret sharing for this. Uh, yeah. But the basic idea is just, okay, we have a list of friends and yeah. N out of M, like kind of another multisig. Yeah. And all of them uh, friends have to collude to uh, override uh, the owner configuration of your own multisig. Okay. Um, okay. The issue here is that, well, you trust, uh, first of all, you trust your friends yeah. that they don't mind. Uh, and you also trust them that they're, that they're actually able to maintain their own access. So what yeah. if your friend loses access to their accounts, then the mm -hmm. system also doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. So I think ultimately, you port abandoned this idea for now. Mm -hmm. uh, what we are trying to do is we still try to find like the best mix of the different ideas mm -hmm. that still offers a good trade-off between 
usability and security. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, security has to have focus, but you still have to have something that's somewhat usable yeah. that offers you to have like a last resort option. Mm -hmm. um, and in also safe, uh, so we are currently planning to do the mainnet release in uh, end of October. Mm -hmm. So hopefully just before uh, DEF CON. Mm -hmm. And um, we will start without this recovery option because okay. that still needs time uh, and we don't want to rush. Uh, and the way how the initial safe will be set up is a two out of four multisig. So you have mm -hmm. a key on your phone a key on your notebook and those keys are never exposed to you. Uh, we never expect you to do any kind of backup with those. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are two more keys and they are actually derived from a, from a seed phrase. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they require to have a backup of a seed phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have the seed phrase, then you can always gain back access mm -hmm. and you don't have to back up your phone or your notebook. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one cool feature of the safe is um, that you never have to fund any of your accounts. Mm -hmm. So the funding for transaction, transactions can be directly deducted from the funds that you hold into in your safe itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something really cool because previously multi-stick wallets were always difficult to set up because you had to have multiple ledgers. All of them had to have ether. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it took quite some time and effort to do this. Now it's really simple. You just have to send ether or mm -hmm. whatever token you have uh, to your safe. Mm -hmm. And then whatever transactions are done, they are always uh, paid with the money that's held in the safe itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. And so, like, uh, like you, are you seeing like, uh, like, where's the? What are some like interesting projects that are working in like the recovery problem? Um, so, I, I had a chat with uh, Rick of Balance.io, and he also like, like he mentioned you as well that uh, you are like one of the four thinkers in this field. So, like, uh, can you share like how that is how this part of the crypto space is evolving? Yeah, that's a. Uh... Honestly, I still uh, haven't discovered like all possible projects probably, but I know, for example, um, uh, for example, Micros Research, they recently published some information that they are working uh, on a better way to, um, to restore access to private keys without requiring private key management, without giving any more details. So I'm really interested to see what they're actually going to publish. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I know that uh, yeah, there are several projects that try to integrate some sort of KYC processes. Hmm. So uh, I, I think there will be multiple solutions in the end. Mm -hmm. And I think also here again, eventually we can come up with some standards to, uh, to allow users to decide and to have some sort of competition. Mm -hmm. between those so I, I see it similar to the oracle space okay uh, it's a super hard problem and yeah i think the most important is to be really on some sort of standard first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. got it got it so like uh safe you are planning to launch um in september like, around the uh, da, da, devcon time and uh what about dutch X end of, and, sorry end of october yeah End of October, sorry. Okay. Um, and uh, what about like Dutch eggs and prediction markets? Like what are the timeframes there? Yeah, so in terms of prediction markets, um, we already have a framework released. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone can use this. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but we are still working on new versions. So basically mm -hmm. we try to uh, make the prediction market framework even more gas efficient. Mm -hmm. And we also try to uh, make it easier to build more complex prediction markets. So mm -hmm. you see, for example, prediction markets, um, which are combining different prediction markets, like having okay. a specific trade under certain conditions. Yeah, like so something like recursion. market is like you create tokens which have a value under a certain condition. Yeah, okay. And you can kind of nest those uh, prediction markets mm -hmm. by... Um, yeah, by requiring uh, different conditions to be met with, yeah. from different kind of oracles. And currently that's quite gas uh, intensive. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to build this with the Gnosis framework and with the next generation, you will be able to create really complex prediction markets. Mm -hmm. um, yes, efficiently. Okay. Um, so again, like you can already build prediction markets, uh, but yeah, there will of course still be updates. And in terms of Dutch exchange, um, there is already uh, some what we call developer release. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's we, we aim to basically go live within hopefully the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, from the development side, everything is basically done. Okay. So like uh, in the prediction market, um, like I, I went to like mainnet.gnosis.pm and like you had some um, prediction markets there already learning. So like what's the major technical challenge that you're facing right now? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's the same probably as for uh, every other DM that mm -hmm. Ethereum itself is kind of the bottleneck mm -hmm. in terms of uh, like transaction fees, uh, number of transactions um, but we are still optimistic that we uh, can be successful that we have actually market participants uh, mm -hmm. and creating valuable information using our prediction markets yeah. um, and the reason is that we are using uh, a different kind of market mechanism mm -hmm. as our competitors so what we are using is something called an automated market maker mm -hmm instead of a regular order book, for example. Mm -hmm. And prediction markets are uh, also, in many cases, low liquidity markets, uh, yeah. because predictions can be pretty specific, mm -hmm. and there might not be that many participants. Mm -hmm. And that's why it makes sense to have a mechanism that provides initial liquidity, and that's what the automated market maker does. And it's like kind of a bot that okay. you, as the one who's interested in information, you can fund this bot. And the bot okay. will always take the other side uh -huh. um, and will change the price for the outcome that he's trading depending on the demand. So if lots of people buy Donald Trump tokens and the market maker will automatically mm -hmm. increase the price for Donald Trump tokens. Okay. And that's, that's a very neat mechanism mm -hmm. that allows you to, uh, yeah, to basically buy information from everyone else participating. Mm -hmm. uh, and provide the initial liquidity that's required to kickstart the market. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, so, and like, how uh, how do you see that the Ethereum uh, problem? Like, uh, like what is going to solve the trouble that the DApps are facing? Uh, in from Ethereum, like the Ethereum Foundation team, like, do they what do they need to work on? Like, do so they have like two three things they're working on: state channels, plasma sharding. Like, what exactly do you think that? Uh, you require yeah so i think the way how ethereum foundation currently tries to tackle problems is um to kind of outsource also quite a lot of research mm -hmm. uh, i think vitalik recently mentioned that the Ethereum foundation is now spending more money on grants than on their own developers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and I think that makes sense because otherwise you are not able to scale efficiently enough. You have to get other people involved more actively yeah. and grants are a great way to do this. And if you look at where they are paying out grants to, then this is very much focused also on this problem of scalability. Mm -hmm. yeah, so scalability um, in terms of layer two solutions. Mm -hmm. So layer two solutions are solutions which are still using Ethereum as uh, the, main, um, settlement. the main settlement layer, exactly. Um, but they they run off-chain. And this includes eight channels. So they are now, I think there was a bigger grant given, given to L4 for the development of counterfactual state channels. Yeah. Um, and then there were many grants given to projects that tried to build plasma chains. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And... I, from my perspective, what we will see within the next couple of months mm -hmm. are the first uh, operating plasma chains that allow you to do uh, a much higher transaction throughput than is currently possible on Ethereum. Okay. Uh, but with very little gas cost. Because the great thing about plasma is that the gas costs that you have mm -hmm. in a normal operation are constant. Yeah, you just submit the hashes okay. that are representing the current state of the plasma chain. Mm -hmm. on the main chain. And this is always a constant cost in terms of gas yeah. costs. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but whatever you do like on the side chain on the plasma chain mm -hmm. um, that is independent of this so you can have like thousands millions of transactions in the plasma chain mm -hmm. um, but you still have constant operational costs yeah. and that's yeah. why i think plasma is the way to go in the short term mm -hmm. of course hopefully in the mid to long term uh, mm -hmm. ethereum itself can evolve and yeah. i think currently the sharding roadmap aims to have a release of sharding by 2020 yeah. which is not that far away mm -hmm. so hopefully uh, they can make this happen this would of course uh, help a lot more projects because also plasma is like not not necessarily the silver bullet but mm -hmm. it just helps for specific use cases especially for exchanges for example mm -hmm. and i think if you think about crypto adoption then decentralized exchanges play a very crucial role so uh, today the main use case is still mostly yeah, conducting icos mm -hmm. and we create all kind of new tokens mm -hmm. they need to it. They are then most of the time uh, traded on a centralized exchange and they are leaving the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But if you actually want to use those tokens within our ecosystem, then they also have to be traded in a decentralized ecosystem. And that's why it's super important to have secure wallet solutions and have really efficient exchanges. And there, I think, Plasma exchanges will, within this year or hopefully the next year, mm -hmm. uh, will become uh, dominant at least for ERC20 tokens. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, and like Stefan, like you were like one of the first, one of the first uh, ICOs that happened on Ethereum. So like for the final note for this video, I just wanted to talk about that. So um, like if we compare to say a normal startup, um, they have like revenue coming in um, and they raise more money based on the numbers. And then after that, they do like series A, series B, series C. Um, but in ICO, like you're just raising money once and then you are hoping that that money will last and like the token price would uh, increase. And if you are holding the tokens, you can like sell them uh, and pay the salaries and all that. So like, how do you see that that model, like the, how has that model worked for you? Like the ICO model, um, because at the end of the day, you are building open source software. Um, you, are, you don't have like, um, like paying customers or like revenue as such. Um, so yeah, how has that worked out and how are you like, uh, how, how do you see like the, how do you plan to make money as well? Yeah. So for us, it was a really interesting experience because everything changed after the ICO. So mm -hmm. we just did the ICO before the enormous ether rally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so basically we raised $12.5 million mm -hmm. because we knew at the time how we would like to spend $12.5 million. Mm -hmm. And then we just got extremely lucky that the Ether price went up very significantly from $50 up to $1,400, mm -hmm. which put us into the position where we had suddenly a lot more funds than we ever imagined. Yeah. Um, and this, of course, changed also the scope of, uh, of NOSA itself quite a lot. Yeah. It allowed us to do quite a lot of things that normally a startup would probably never do. Mm -hmm. So we have funds to create a co-working space for the community in Berlin, this full North co-working space. Mm -hmm. We have funds to conduct a conference in Berlin mm -hmm. for the community in Berlin. Yeah. We are able to not only work on prediction markets, but also create fundamental uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. that hopefully can help boost the entire ecosystem. And I, I have the feeling that all those projects which were in the same position as us, like mm -hmm. Status uh, mm -hmm. and many others, we all see ourselves in a position where we see, okay, we are also responsible for making the entire system work. Mm -hmm. We have to build a lot of infrastructure for the community mm -hmm. to actually fulfill our own uh, yeah, promises. Mm -hmm. In our case, building actually like globally, globally available prediction markets, which still don't really exist today. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also, yeah, it's, it's a great experience um, mm -hmm. and we hope that we can contribute to that. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, also quite a lot of responsibility uh, that mm -hmm. we didn't expect in that extent, but it's great. So we are really happy uh, to be in the situation. In terms of the token sale, uh, uh, yeah, at the time of the token sale, people were, were arguing, yeah, this kind of token sale model 
Mm -hmm. It's probably not the best. Eventually it will sell out very quickly and then it mm -hmm. happened. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think if we would probably change this, uh, mm -hmm. if we would have to do this again, mm -hmm. um, but we won't. So mm -hmm. I'm just saying like for, I think other teams, they did it then also differently. So for example, Raiden, mm -hmm. they did a Dutch auction as well, but they started at a super high amount, more ether than was in existence at that time, actually. So mm -hmm. they changed this model a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I would not say that necessarily every ICO will uh, be... I, I don't think that doing an ICO necessarily means that you will never raise money again. Yeah, uh, It seems quite likely right now. And for us, it seems very unlikely that we will ever have to do anything like this again. But I think for many other teams, mm -hmm. it's probably much more reasonable. Mm -hmm. And I think it also makes sense to to more grow organically yeah, yeah. rather than just raising a huge amount up front and then you have to deliver. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think you, you don't really do yourself a favor if you create super high expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, rather deliver and then continuously uh, increase funding if that's required. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also having too much funding is maybe not the best because you lose focus. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having less money can also definitely help you in just delivering exactly what you need. Mm -hmm. um, you have to find a good trade-off. I think at Gnosis we found a good trade-off. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to be really efficient in the way how we use our funding. Mm -hmm. So we split up teams uh, into like, we don't have one huge team working on one thing, but we have many different small teams and they are executing very efficiently. Mm -hmm. And this way we think we can handle this. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot, Stefan, for your insights. Um, I really enjoyed talking with you. And I think we covered quite a lot, ranging from everything like what is happening in Ethereum uh, to like the specifics of Gnosis. Yeah. Thanks a lot for taking the time out. Thanks, Arnav. Thanks for having me.